a pleasure to be here and I am joined by Dr. Louise Toppin and Dr. Adolphus Hailstork. Um, my name is Naomi Andre. Dr. Toppin and I are professors at the University of Michigan and we are here in Ann Arbor. Dr. Hailstork is joining us from his studio in Virginia Beach, um, Virginia. And it is just a pleasure to talk about opera and vocal music and the process of what went into Rise for Freedom. We're going to start with, um, before we get into sort of the details of the opera specifically, we're going to start with just some general overview. I'm going to start us out, but then I will pass it over to Dr. Toppin, who, with her many hats, is an incredible singer who is embarking on a recording project for a uh, probably a total of two volumes of all of Dr. Hale Stark's um, works for solo for soprano voice. I'm going to start us off by saying that um, Dr. Hale Stork is somebody who is known very well for his music that is both in um, the academy settings in concert halls um, all over the place. It spans a wide range. It's music that is written from a real knowledgeable sense of both vernacular folk music, as well as complicated harmonic and other um, <sighs> types of academic styles, both for opera, cantata, oratorio, song cycle, songs. It's really um, a pleasure to be able to talk with one of the leading Black art composers um, of today. And I think I will turn this over to Dr. Toppin. Thank you so much, Dr. Andre, and welcome, Professor Dr. Hale Stork. Um, I wanted to start us off with vocal music, um, because it is such an important part of your overall musical output. Can you talk about your process and if it changes when you write an opera as opposed to when you write a song or oratory or song cycle? And I should say that uh, Dr. Hale Stork has written uh, one, two, three, four, five art song cycles, ventriloquist acts of God, summer life song, three spirit songs, three simple songs, and songs of love and justice, as well as um, as we began embarking on our, our recording, it's 56 songs just for soprano. So he knows the voice well, um, and he writes for the, the voice. He's written, done, made my vow as a major oratorio. Um, and then there's a plethora of songs. So how does your process change when we look at song or when we look at um, opera? That's an interesting question. When I'm just writing an individual song, um, it's got to be a coherent whole by itself. And um, I just do it. It's, I, uh, I like to write songs, but I actually think I'm, I'm more of, I'm theatrical enough to like to prefer cycles because the cycle suggests by its name that something recycles and uh, almost all of my song cycles bring something back at the end that had occurred earlier in the, in the series so that it's unified as a large arc. And that's what I keep, try to keep in mind when um, I write a cycle. A string of songs by themselves don't automatically, in my opinion, make a good cycle. You have to, it, it should have a dramatic arc. And um, uh, and, and if you figure there are five songs and the one in the middle might be a special uh, peak moment or down moment. Uh, and uh, if, if it's um, uh, three songs like um, the three spirit songs, uh, I want them to either be ABA in terms of the mood. You have to, you always have to control the mood uh, when you do large pieces. A piece like Done Made My Vow, um, I actually sketched out the entire um, plan in terms of the tension levels and the placement of the different parts so that it I knew where the down moments were and where I would do the builds. To me, uh, music is aural, A-U-R-E-L, theater. And so the, the, there must be um, a strong sense of drive 
of going somewhere or a denouement, whatever you like. Thank you for that answer. Um, your operas have been commissioned by Cincinnati Opera, Opera Theater of St. Louis, Lyric Opera of Kansas, Trilogy Opera, and Dayton Opera Companies, and are all operas 35 to 70 minutes in length. And I will say which one. Rise for Freedom was done for Cincinnati Opera, as I recall, Joshua's Boots for Opera Theater of St. Louis, and Lyric Opera of Kansas, Robeson for Trilogy Opera Company, which is a unique company in New Jersey that specializes in works by African-American composers. Um, and so I know that they, uh, with Kevin Maynard as the artistic director, sang the title role of Robeson. And then Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Common Ground by Dayton Opera Company. And I believe it was done with their touring company, if I recall mm. correctly. Um, so all of your operas are 35 to 70 minutes in length. Can you talk about your choice for the length of the operas? Did it allow you to fully explore the story and the themes presented? And was there was there a reason other than the, the commission itself that presented the length? Or how, how did you make that choice? Well, Dr. Toppin, the uh, first one I did was the Paul Lawrence Dunbar Common Ground. And uh, really what that, so-called opera is, is a, uh, a, a staged song cycle. Um, the Dayton Opera Company, you know, Dayton is where Paul Lawrence Dunbar spent his life, um, had uh, uh, an idea to, in honor of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, to uh, stitch some of the poetry together to make um, hopefully a dramatic arc and, and uh, certainly um, use for uh, talented opera singers, young, talented opera singers. And um, I worked with the person there, if, at Herbert Martin, Dr. Herbert Martin, who was professor at Dayton University at that time, who looks just like Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And you talk about reincarnation of somebody, it's amazing. And I'm still working with him, by the way. And um, he and I picked out the poems and uh, and the verses of whichever poem, I think we used all of them. We used, I think we used all the lines of whatever uh, poems we picked, and um, made a I made a piece out of it. And uh, I think they stipulated not more than about an hour, and uh, they staged it in Dayton, and uh, it, it's. Uh, it's very challenging, and, and only in one way, particularly, and that is the baritone part was, uh, let's say, insensitively written by the composer. And it's called, it's really better for a second tenor than for a baritone because it goes up to high A's. And um, and uh, but it was it was my first effort at this kind of thing, and it it works nicely. There's some nice tunes in it, uh, but it, it doesn't get done, and and. Uh, but that's okay. That's uh, I, you, know, you said I can say anything. I said I'm, I weep over that one a little bit. But it's not a it's not a bad piece. Uh, and then uh, Joshua's boots. Now they they uh, Joshua's boots. The educational director, I think, of the St. Louis uh, Opera. Uh, you know they they have a very strong and both both these cities, uh, St. Louis Opera and Kansas City Opera, have very strong children's opera programs. And um, they said uh, they wanted an opera that teenagers could sing, mostly. They would hire three professional singers to play the leads. And uh, it could be no more than 45 minutes long. I try to talk them into a greater length because I, was, I get carried away sometimes when I write. And they said, no, nope, flat out, 45 minutes, that's it. That's because they needed the bus students in, students in, uh, to see it and then get them out and bring the next group in. And you only have 15 minutes to do that. So 45 minutes and, and the curtain falls. So uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, woman from um, New York wrote that script that, and it worked out okay. It's a very touching story. You know, Joshua, um, a, a black a young a black man from, I think from Georgia. I had to run away to uh, the Midwest, uh, to Kansas, to 
uh, save his life because his father had just gotten hanged and he had hit one of the uh, clansmen or, who, or whoever with an anvil in, from his, um, the father worked with leather for, to, for horses. He knew horses, Joshua knew horses, ran away to Kansas, talked himself onto a farm. They told him he could be, uh, he could be a wrangler. He could, which means the person who controls the group of horses that the real cowboys uh, will ride when they're handling the cows. And so he, he, was, he was superb. And it turned out they, 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 they gave him an audition and we musicians know about auditions. And they said, if you can ride that Mustang over there, we'll give you a job. And uh, Joshua uh, got on the horse knew, uh, and knew horses and, and rode the horse to a standstill. And uh, all the other cowboys who were white, of course, uh, were flabbergasted. And um, Joshua got the job. He wound up saving uh, the trail boss's life uh, during a stampede and, uh, and got moved up, got promoted to cowboy. But anyway, it was, it was, it was a nice story. And uh, that was kind of my first real libretto opera. Um, Rise for Freedom. Ah, this is the one I'm, I'm really very proud of. Um, can't, uh, the Cincinnati. Uh, I, had a, I had a good time in Ohio. I was big in Ohio once upon a time. First there was Dayton, and then there was Cincinnati. And uh, Cincinnati said they wanted to do uh, an opera uh, on a guy who, John P. Parker, who lived up the road um uh right across the ohio river from kentucky he's he was a an escaped slave he went back frequently in the middle of the night and helped other slaves escape and um uh this is the his story and it's, it's interesting he not only helped the slaves escape he also as a blacksmith um had a wood had, had a metal shop on the ohio river and the white plantation owners who owned slaves would come to him to buy his product of new plows because he had the best plows in the area. <laughs> and there was one particular uh, purchaser who uh, said he's gonna, he, he wanted his plows, but he was also gonna catch his hide someday um, running off slaves. And so the main fight was between the two of them. And, uh, he dared uh, John P. Parker to come across the river and steal his slaves. And John P. Parker, accepting a dare as he would, did. He stole the slaves, stole the baby, the, the slave woman had just had. They escaped across the raging river and uh, uh, got safely to the other side. The guy came storming into, where's, where's my slave? How dare you, et cetera, et cetera. But they, they, got, the, they got the people to safety on the way to the, to the Underground Rail to, Railroad up, up to Canada. And, um, and, and, and Parker prevailed in that particular instance. This a whole thing in this uh, opera takes place before the Civil War. Uh, and it was interesting. I had to end it in a way in which the slave owners were saying, we will hold on to our property. And John P. Parker was saying, I'm going to steal your property and get set them free. And um, uh, uh, that's the way it ends. And I, I, and I, 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 they end on one great clashing chord of D major, D minor, with the uh, slave owners singing in D minor and the, the, the victorious townspeople who were very strongly abolitionists in, in, in uh, his town. Um, we're singing in D major saying we're going to fight for freedom. It, it, it was a fun, fun show. Uh, and uh, oh, I just remembered. That's the one you guys are going to do. And I am so excited about that. <laughs> so you must have, have you been to rehearsals? I'm going this week. I'll start okay. being in rehearsals all of this week. But of course, I've worked with the singers individually and enjoyed uh -huh. working on the music. Definitely. Oh, okay. Good, 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 good. And, and then finally, Robeson. Robeson is the saddest story of my creative life because it's never been done again. It's, it was, uh, no one knows. The, the, the librettist 
and never gave permission for it to be done. This has happened to me twice. Uh, another piece uh, was a narration project uh, called Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, it can't be done because the librettist uh, said no. And um, the librettist for Robeson said no. And uh, uh, the, the publisher can't do anything if the librettist says no, no matter what the composer wants. So um, that's that's a sad story. But it's a heroic story, of course, of the great Paul Robeson. And um, that has some nice moments in it. Is, do you so, feel, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. It's OK. Well, I was going to follow up with what you just said, if I can ask a quick couple quick follow ups. One is, do you feel like you were able to completely tell the stories you wanted uh, because all of them are shorter? Would you have wanted any of them? Because I know you, you they had some restrictions, but like Robeson, um, which wasn't for necessarily children or a younger audience or any of those constraints um, of a touring piece. What, what, would you want your next opera to be two to three hours? Uh, or, or do you feel like that's necessary to tell the story in the way, do you feel like you told it completely the way you, uh, with the time? There's nothing wrong with a, a one act opera. Um, Not at all. As a, as a, uh, as a 19th century romantic, I, I, I have yearned over the years to, do a full evening's opera. Um, but I think my, my time has passed on that because operas are such an investment of time and energy that um, uh, I, in discussing it over uh, with my missus, she says, you know, Adolf, that uh, you actually get more performances with your concert arias and your song cycles than with an opera. And so the, 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 it's, it's the, what do you call it? The cost benefit uh, of sure. the situation. Sure. Uh, that's the, that, that, that was my, what you were talking about, uh, Dr. Toppin, is, is, was my fantasy, but I have learned to live with the reality. Well, I think that you're, you're absolutely right. Those shorter operas, that was very smart in that they do allow more possibilities um, because there's many traditions, the telephone by Minotti and many other shorter works that have received more performances because they weren't um, so onerous for costs and the number of people. Right. So I was just more concerned. Did you feel like you had the completeness to tell the story the way you wanted to, or did you feel compressed? Oh. I guess that was more no. um, what no. I was trying to get to. They're all well-rounded. Yes. All, all of them are well-rounded and they, they all uh, peak and uh, uh, sustain interest, I hope. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, sustain attention um you know I'll, I'll let audience members judge for themselves uh, this this will be the second performance i believe of mm -hmm. rise for freedom uh joshua's boots has been done more than once and uh that that, that that's a that's a sweet piece that really is and ends with a heroic ending where he says now i'm a darn cowboy you know and then and, and the kids love it the kids like and there are wonderful film clips on YouTube. That's how I found uh, Joshua's Boots for the oh. presentation I did last summer. And I guess my last question, which is going to segue into Dr. Andre, has to do with each of your subject matter. For this, you have a, an ex-slave, you have a cowboy who's running away from oppression as an African-American. You have Paul Robeson, a scholar, a musician. Um, and an important voice uh, for African Americans. And then you have Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the first international poet. So your four subjects that you chose were African American um, subjects and important parts of African American history. Um, can you speak about the subjects that you have chosen and what appeals to you as you're making your choices? Heroic black figures, that's it. Um, in this case, they they all happen to have been guys. Um, the uh, 
although the Dunbar really isn't has does not have a specific hero, um, the others did, and um, uh, their stories need to be told. And I'm there are many other composers coming along right now who believe in that and um, are doing it and, and doing it wonderfully. So. Um, uh, yeah, that's 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 the way it has to be. That's it has to grow that way. We just can't keep hearing about the dukes and duchesses of Europe and the queens and the, and the grand palaces. No, there there are there are a thousand and thousand stories among uh, African American people themselves just surviving for four hundred years. My fourth symphony is called Survive. And I, I take on subjects of survival in America as an African American. So, um, and I love that you've done that throughout your career. I mean, these are not new operas; these are from the eighties and nineties. Yeah, yeah. So that that was a part of your of your consciousness as a, a composer, and even most recently during the. Um, era of the 2020, you wrote a knee on his neck. I mean, so you have yeah. always been talking about current issues in the black community and the importance. You have been that voice that has written on Emily Dickinson and, and every other poet, but you've also embraced and told the story of African-Americans. Um, and I'm gonna let Professor Andre, Dr. Andre talk. Yeah, actually, the one success I've had is not, it's not an opera, but, but um, uh, the, the, the one success I've had with an African-American librettist has been um, a, uh, a, a cantata uh, the, uh, with, on words of Rita Dove. If you ever wrote, read her uh, uh, thing called Testimonial, her poem called Testimonial, which is painted on a wall outside of uh, University of Virginia, where she's a professor, um, uh, I was asked to set that and, uh, she gave permission. There's been no conflict about it at all. And it worked out very nicely. Calls for a soprano soloist and, uh, uh, and, 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 and a small orchestra, Mozart size orchestra. So, uh, that's another piece thing. I just wanted to throw it in there. That's really where most of my my vocal, big vocal writing has been in cantata and orchestra, chorus and orchestra, chorus, orchestra, chorus soloist and orchestra. Um, uh, I, I, since I came up as a choral person, as a singer, it, it was, it's a natural for me. It's possibly more natural than opera, but my, 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 my uh, theatrical side yearns uh, to do opera. I respond to the opera, the dramatic situation. In fact, this is a perfect segue into some of the questions I wanted to um, talk about or ask you about to discuss. I was really struck by a comment you made right before we started um, this um, filming or Zooming, uh, where you talked about how you're writing sort of this theatrical uh, side you've got and song cycles and opera are a chance for aural theater, sort of this A-U-R-A-L, what you hear about. Actually, I think you said that early on. Forgive me. I think it wasn't before. Well, no, I, I spelled it differently. A-U-R-A-L. Actually, all of my music is like that because remember, you have to sustain attention. Yes. I mean, uh, just you just can't throw something against the wall and hope it sticks. You got you have to. I was talking to uh, Mark Shapiro, a very fine choral conductor based in New York City, to, earlier, and uh, you know I, I don't know that you know you you you. He was asking asking me about the craft, and I love talking about the craft. And I said, yeah, you know, you have to use the tools of your craft to sustain uh, attention. See now, since I do symphonic stuff, that's that's tougher. Because you know, you, there's no word there saying, "Oh, this is an extra minute." It's nothing to it. And and when you do symphonic stuff or just pure chamber stuff, um, you have to know how to put the piece together so that it makes sense and sp spins its web in a way that sustains attention and has that both the performer and the listener feel that their investment of time and energy is worthwhile. It's so helpful for, I'm a musicologist, and so to hear that there's so much thought put into the architecture, into the form of what you're doing, and how tension yeah. is a big part of it. 
I, right. in terms of um, with different songs, the number of songs in a song cycle, there are certain moments you can reach at the middle, in the beginning, sort of leading to and from that. I'm wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about how does this work in All Rise for Freedom? Is it um, based on, because in addition with um, operas, you've got characters. And so each of them, I guess, in terms of the plot, reaches an up moment or a down moment, sort of, or has an mm. arc through it. Mm. Um, mm. And then the language, the musical language you use, which is both, is both identifiable as this is Hale Stork, but it also is really varied for the different types of works you write. Is there a particular moment in All Rise for Freedom or an aria section or something that you can tell us a little bit about working through it? And I know this is from 2007 and you've done so no, many projects. That's okay. That, that's okay. You know, I, I, I'm very regretful I can't get up to, to, to see that. It's, 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 it's a shame that it has to be done the same week as I have to be for, uh, in, in town for uh, a knee on the neck. Oh, uh, well, congratulations. Yeah, with all yeah. I, uh, we talked about flying up there and flying back. And, you know, if, if I were 15 years younger, I'd probably be nothing to it. But uh, the, um, uh, now, first of all, you have to give credit to the librettist. The librettist molded a beautiful text for this piece uh, the, that you're doing. David Gonzalez wrote a fantastic text. Ever since uh, he wrote it, and um, I have praised him more than once, uh, just personally, telling him what a fine libretto he wrote. I had, uh, we met one time in, in New York City before he got to work on it. And the only thing I had, remember asking him was, hey, give me a love song. I am a romantic, <laughs> give me a love song between the husband and the wife. And he did that. Oh. Um, so uh, uh, other than that, you know, the I, all I had to do was follow uh, his script outline and uh, make sure, he, here's something I, 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 when I was teaching, I would tell students, you have to separate the, um, the storyline from the emotional. Uh, that's why composers had recitative and aria. Uh, the, uh, um, you, it, the, where, where to not get in the way of the words by thinking that you're gonna emote all over the place. Um, just um, set the word, plainly uh i'm i'm a great stickler for uh, diction and i try but sopranos don't help me with that <laughs> i try to write every single syllable in a placement that the word can be understood and the uh it, it but because the, the, such a big sound has to be generated, for especially for opera sopranos, Over then uh, then then you get a what I mostly get is a big um, uh, a, a big vowel sound, uh, and uh, and with the correct rhythm. <laughs> and what did he say? But I uh, there was a there's a composer named Conrad Souza who. Um, uh, I, uh, I I took a not I, not a personal workshop. I sat in on uh, a, a clinic he had um, at the St. Louis Opera when I was out there, and um, he was talking about setting the, the 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 things you really want to be understood as being the speaking area of the voice, and that's what I try to do. Um, but uh, I, I I can think I went off on a tangent. But uh, you're asking about structure. And uh, uh, he gave me, David gave me a good structure and all I had to do was decide where I'm gonna allow the singer to emote and really mm -hmm. sp spread her wings um, as a singer. And I like that you broke it up and excuse me, I just wanna jump in here because you've said so many rich things that you can break it into sort of an emotional text and then a sort of the narrative that propels yeah. it yeah 
Yeah. Does he, did you say, oh, this is, you, you asked for a love song or a love duet. Mm-hmm. So was there an obvious duet? Is there obvious arias? And then you string it together with something sort of through composed or more recitative like in between? Well, I like the duet since I mentioned the duet. And he starts off by saying, Miranda, Miranda, it's time for me to go. He was going to go over across the river to Kentucky to rescue some slaves. And she, all the time, his wife, um, feared for her, for her, his life every yeah. time he did this. And uh, David put that fear in there. And do you really have to go? Uh, are you sh- are you sure? Uh, and and please come back safely to me. That that kind of thing. And um, I, I happen to love uh, that moment. Uh, in, in the show very much. Um, and then he, uh, he, he, they talk about, well, who would, if, he, if I don't do it, who will, who's gonna do this? Who's gonna rescue the slaves? And she says, why does it have to be you? Um, and then, um, then when I get to the, the, the musical cadence of the piece, he finishes by saying Miranda, but then she's, she says, well, you go, but make sure you come back to me safely. And uh, it's, it's a tender ending. Um, mm-hmm. So I like, I like that a lot. So you uh, just walked us through ahead. the tension and the emotion there. And then it sounds like there's a real release with the tenderness at the end. Well, she yeah, yeah. Gotta go. there's an understanding that he's going to, he's going to go and, 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 and he'll come back to her. Um, the, another spot that I especially like is, uh, yeah, I don't know if I can read it without the text, but um, it, it, I build it up to a really nice climax. Uh, or as I, you know, it's just, um, uh, I can hear the people calling. I can hear their voices calling. I can hear their voices calling uh, for freedom. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm going to go across the river and I'm going to, get these people back home to safely uh, I, because I'm a man and I'm, you know, I'm sorry for the sexist language that David put in there. And then he, you know, and the, his highest note in the whole show is right there. And it ends very early, strong uh, climax. And um, uh, that, that's, that's one of his big moments. Actually, that moment's a showstopper. That's one of the showstopper moments. That's uh, I hope the conductor will leave, leave time because that to for the audience to applaud. Because if if the singer does it right, he, he can bring down the house with that. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. One of my one I do use models. One of my one, my favorite one of my favorite models is Richard Rogers. And if you know the soliloquy from Carousel, oh. Boy, yeah, my boy, you know, it's just, it, it, it grabs you. It's so powerful and on you. So um, uh, that's, that's, uh, I grew up on Rodgers and Hammerstein. I'm so glad I did. Mm. But today's, today's musicals don't do much, I think. Uh. Well, some people wonder, are musicals moving more towards opera or not? But I love to hear the way you've sort of used, talk about your models with a musical style where you can still like really follow it and you can follow sort of, okay, we're moving through the narrative and now here's the really expansive moment. Thank Mm -hmm. you for explaining those, those particular points for, um, in this work. I haven't seen it yet. So I'm really looking forward to it. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Louise, do you want to jump in? Yeah. I also wanted to say thank you for your explanation about how you use the voice. Um, as a person who has sung so much of your music, I can say everything you said is exactly what I was thinking about the understandability of the text, the way you put it in our modal voice to make the text when we have to articulate it really clear. And then when we're on an upper, a higher note, you're using it for us to give an expressive moment and to express an emotion that goes with it because you know we're gonna have to modify a vowel and lose some of the understandability right. of the word. Right. You right. are you are one of the clearest song composers in terms of that 
it, it's just lovely to hear you explain it based on what I've known for 30 years singing your music um, and, and that every piece does the exact, uses that same model, but in ways that musically are fresh and new and inventive harmonies, nothing is static or feels like I'm singing the same song, even though I've sung your songs from the eighties to the most recent ones you wrote for me in 2021. So yeah, it's, I appreciate completely what you've just said. One thing recently, you know, I, I keep learning, you keep learning in this business. And one of, that's one of the great reasons to go into classical composition. It is a learning experience that will never end. And I only recently have um, taken more sensitive, uh, paid more sensitive attention to the conclusion of a vowel. Um, you know, when I, when, when I was younger, Okay, you, you, we know we want to hold the initiate vowel, the, 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 the open vowel and, and, and stuff like that. And so let's take a word like shine or you are mine. Okay. Oh, ah, ah, yeah, no problem. But getting off that high note is a bear with that because they both close with closed vowels. I, you know, you wind up strangling the force of battle to death. So I have learned now in my old age to drop the word down in pitch before I conclude the word so that she can finish it with an understandable ending. And uh, to me, that's a big breakthrough. Uh, I was just uh, very happy about that. It's much appreciated. I noticed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I mean, people don't think about the, the you have an initial and you have a vanishing part right. of the vowel. Right. And they focus on the initial and leave the singer yeah. to figure out what right. to do with the vanishing. Right. And you're absolutely right. Thank you. That was that was so wonderfully sad that we're always growing and expanding and learning. And right. I guess my, I, my concluding question to you would be, what do you hope that audiences will take away from this production? Oh, wow. Uh, I hope they walk out with a hope that the composer got a copy of the tape. <laughs> we will make sure that happens. Not to worry. <laughs> this is breaking my heart that I can't come in. But anyway, um, uh, the, uh, well, I, I've heard people say they finally, they, his text is so good, Dave, that people have said, I finally understand it from the standpoint of the slave owner. Now, remember, when the slave owners in, in, in the late eight, uh, 19th century were fighting to keep their slaves, they were fighting to keep their property. And in the text, he says, my father had slaves. My grandfather had slaves. I'm supposed to have slaves. This is my heritage. And <laughs> that's freaky. That is, the, you know, that, that's a freaky thought, but that's, that allows you to see, as evil as it is, the standpoint of the slave owner. And um, uh, it, it, it can be a powerful moment. And he has a good aria. He's got a good aria uh, to, to present that. Uh, I hope they have a good uh, tenor. It's got to be nasty. I mean, uh, he can't be a sweet tenor. He's got to okay. he's got to have a nasty attitude and uh, delivery uh, because he is a mean human being. But he's, he's my justification, and uh, so it's a crucial moment in the history of the country. That's what I hope they'll they'll take away from it. As long I hope they know that this is before the Civil War took place. So. Uh, that this 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 is a, a conflict that's built. It's you know it's built into the story. It's just so built into the story. All I had to do was rise to the occasion, and I and I hope I did. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's so well said. I I also hope that they take this story of an enslaved person to where he ended as an inventor. And it, it's a story of hope. And I'm hoping that that is also a part yeah. of what the audience gets, that it's not just about the trauma of slavery, but it's a piece 
that talks about African Americans moving forward, yeah. um, which is the theme that we are hoping even today that there's always that thought of mm -hmm. moving forward in life, knowing yeah. what's behind you, but focusing on what's ahead of you. But at the time of the actual opera, nobody in the opera knows the Civil War is going to take place. Right. Right. Say? So right. they're just fighting it out locally. Right. And you might think you own those people, but I'm going to free those people. And I think it was before. I don't know if it was before. Well, I don't know. I checked the year, but if it was before Abraham Lincoln got elected. But I think so. And um, we didn't know this. But we knew that the civil strife was rising. Right. But we didn't know that there was actually a civil war. And that's the attitude that have, they have to be. I, You know, when people walk out, let's say they didn't know their history. It's not too far-fetched, I guess. I say, I wonder if they ever solved this problem. Because that's what it is. It's a problem of opera. They, it was unsolved at the time it ends. I think in a way it's still unsolved. And so it's just oh, like. Oh, no. oh yeah. Well, <laughs> the, 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 the last movement of a fourth symphony is still crossing that bridge. Mm. Boy, that is so timely. Yeah. Do you know today is the day? Bloody Sunday? Oh, that's right. March 7th. March 7th, yeah. 1965. Yeah. I read it in the paper yeah. this morning. That's, it is. Uh, how apropos that we're having this conversation. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. I'm so glad that we've had this chance to get, and I just want to pull back a little bit myself, to have both of you talk about this, because Dr. Toppin, you have been living with this music and singing it, and Dr. Hale Stork, you have been thinking about these things and have been doing it for a while, but you're at such a wonderful moment where you can actually talk about what it is. I love this moment of sort of how a vowel needs to be concluded, or like, this is something you learned. I, I get the sense that really came out of doing things mm. uh, on paper, hearing it performed live. And while I was going to mention before, we have the magic of super titles or, you know, titles in um, which helps yeah. a lot. It's, right. um, it, right. it's only aided by terrific composers who are working with thoughtful librettists to be able to get those words out. I, I really appreciate being able to have this moment. I know we're going to be really excited to see this in a few weeks, but also I think this recording can live past that to get your words about this and how the fourth symphony, your fourth symphony is an important piece as you're thinking about some of these themes. So thank you for bringing all that together for us. Just run! 